Um, it's really an honor <coughs> for me to be here, to uh, be part of the Eleanor Chilinski Forum and Legacy, and to follow Michael Quinn Patton and Tom Schwant and Deborah Rogg. And I thank Deborah Rogg for really last year doing a lot of work to talk about why theory and practice in evaluation should be integrated. And I hope I will follow up on that. I also want to thank those who got me invited here. Uh, you know who you are. Guilty as charged. Um, I've been thinking about this for a while. Uh, this um, a really important topic for me. And I was walking in Brooklyn the other day prior to coming here, and I grew up in Brooklyn. You can probably tell I don't have a southern accent. And uh, I really got to thinking about why I, uh, digging down deeper about why it was important for, for me to be here and to want to share ideas with you. And what Laura Levitin has stressed to me about this conference is it's about discussion. It's about conversation. It's about learning. And I'm sticking around here for the full conference because I want to learn from you all. I want to discuss with you all. Uh, what brings me here really um, in terms of my work is outcomes. We live in a world uh, that, and, and a country that has problems with poverty, with homelessness, uh, with chronic disease, with infectious disease. I live in a state that has a low high school graduation rate. There are many, many outcomes that need to be improved. So some of this is a little change from my original script, so I'm just trying to make sure I remember what I wanted, <laughs> what, what I want to say. Um, so there's a theory. There's a theory that we can get better outcomes if we use evidence-based interventions. Um, researchers and funders are definitely invested in that theory. Uh, they will use risk and protective factors, for example, to devise interventions and based on those interventions see whether they get better results than they got, would have gotten without them, with comparison groups or before, after, etc. And then eventually there's a hope that those evidence-based interventions will go to scale where lots of people will use it and that they'll really make a difference at a large level. That's a great theory, um, but there are problems with that. So one of the things I did is, and this may have happened to you, when I first needed to come up with a title for my talk a couple of months ago, I had some idea of what I wanted to say, but I wasn't sure what I was going to say. Did that ever happen to any of you? Okay. I'm a little closer now, <laughs> now that I'm doing this. So this, is real, this is, title is a little closer to what I'm wanting to talk about. Evidence-based interventions are necessary but not sufficient for outcomes. Empowerment evaluation and roles for evaluators in an evidence-based intervention world. I'm sometimes known for long titles that are like abstracts. So here's an overview of what I want to talk about. Evidence-based interventions are necessary but not sufficient. I will want to talk a little bit about taking some of the mystery out of evaluation and accountability. I want to talk a little bit then about empowerment evaluation and a particular approach to empowerment evaluation called getting to outcomes. There is a one of the steps in getting to outcomes deals with the topic of implementation science, and there's a theory and practice part of that. I'm going to need to. Um, probably skim that for today and I'll tell you how I'm going to handle that later. And that empowerment evaluation has been known to be controversial as some of you may have heard. I'll talk about that just a little bit and talk about next steps that you might take uh, in thinking about this. So in terms of evidence-based interventions, one of the ones that struck me recently was a report in the um, New England Journal of Medicine. At first, uh, Atul Gwande and his colleagues, who are well known for the checklist manifesto, said that if you use checklists in surgery, you're more likely to get positive outcomes. And by that, I mean reducing surgical complications and even mortality. And this is an example of a surgical checklist. 
And at first this worked. They had eight sites and they reported this in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they got some really remarkable results pre-post in terms of surgical complications and mortality. And this spread like wildfire. The World Health Organization and others said, hey, this is pretty straightforward. All you got to do is have a checklist and we're going to get all these terrific results. So more recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was an article in which uh, all of the hospitals in Ontario, Canada agreed that they would adopt this checklist. And fortunately, there was an evaluation to see, did this make a difference? And out of the nine, 99 hospitals reported pre-post data, and the pre-post data showed no difference in outcomes once the checklist was instituted, and 97 out of the 99 hospitals said that they had um, complied with the checklist like 99% or 100%. So this raises some questions about what happens with evidence-based interventions when they go to scale. And that's going to be a big deal for us in this talk. Um, now, let's picture if you are the admin administrator of a hospital. So recently in Columbia, South Carolina, where I live, where there are four major hospitals that compete with each other, there was a newspaper article that, said, that posted the patient satisfaction. These, this is for the whole state, and it was a five-star rating system. And you could get five stars, and four hospitals got five stars in patient satisfaction. A number of hospitals got four stars, and one of the four hospitals got three stars. So picture yourself as the administrator of that hospital, or in that hospital that got three, three stars, and there are these other hospitals in your area that got four stars. Um, and so I, I thought of myself as this hospital administrator, and I said, well, what do we need to do here? Maybe we should get an evaluator to help us find out what's going right, what's going wrong, and I definitely want to know how to improve what's happening here. And you know what? I read the New England Journal of Medicine, and you keep telling me about these evidence-based interventions, but I'm not clear this is going to work for me in my hospital. So you as the evaluator need to take that into account. What's going to happen in my hospital that's going to help me get better? And I know that's going to involve evaluation. And I also know that my people are afraid of the word evaluation. So you're going to have to deal with that. You as an evaluator are going to have to deal with evaluating this hospital that I have, helping me get better, and dealing with people's fears about evaluation. Okay? And we're not only talking about hospitals here. You can be thinking about school principals, heads of boys and girls clubs, any kinds of organization that you're familiar with. And what these folks in the practice world are being told is they need to be concerned with needs and resources, needs and resource assessments, setting goals, using best practices or evidence-based approaches, also being told you need to be concerned about fit and cultural competence, you need to be concerned about whether you have the capacity to do the work, you need to have a good plan, you need to implement that plan and have a process evaluation, you need to have an outcome evaluation. You need to do continuous quality improvement. That's really, really big in the healthcare world these days. And you know, you need to sustain good effects. So that's the world of practice, or that's what's being asked of the world of practice. But the science world, the world of NIH and most funders is on the evidence-based intervention on number three. Many of the other factors that the world of practice is being told it should be concerned with is really not being covered by the world of science very much. All right, so back to the idea of demystifying evaluation and accountability. We, we need to, and I'm sure you've confronted many people who are afraid of the words evaluation, of the word evaluation, and even more afraid of the word, word accountability. Uh, this is an important issue for us in the evaluation world. 
What do we do? How do we take some of the mystery out? How do we actually convince people or educate people that evaluation can be helpful to them and be their friend and not just something that can hurt them? And that's something that's um, concerned me for many years now. And one of the things that's puzzled me is that in the real world, people love evaluation. Anybody who's, how many of you go to football games or soccer games or basketball? Raise your hands, okay. How many of you love going to those games, all right? You know people love evaluation. This is our coach at the University of South Carolina, right, John? Steve Spurrier, he's a very well-known football coach. He's a terrific evaluator. He knows what's going on. He knows how the players are doing. He scopes out the opposition. During the game, he's making changes if things aren't working. But not only is he an evaluator and his other coaches, but everyone in the stands, or pretty much everyone in the stands, is evaluating. If you've been to a game, you hear evaluation, right? <laughs> Bad calls, goals, you hear evaluation. People love it. If you've ever listened to the morning after show or this, uh, f of, of a coach, all these people who aren't getting paid to evaluate are evaluating the heck out of that. So people love evaluation in the real world. I'll give you another example. How many of you watch American Idol? Raise your hands, don't be embarrassed. I, <laughs> and I know some of you have probably even voted in American Idol. And in the past, <clears throat> there have many, been as many people voting for American Idol as have voted for president, okay? And they evaluate. There are blogs about it. There are, um, did this song fit that singer? You know, was that the right song to pick? There are all kinds of evaluation going on. So in the real world, people love evaluation. And we really need to figure out how evaluation can play a bigger role in the world of nonprofits, hospitals, et cetera, the, role, you know, the evaluation areas that we deal with. So one of the things I try to do, and what I'm going to tell you is that in four slides, I can um, picture three major concepts of evaluation. I teach a course in program evaluation. I still want people to take my course. But in these four slides, so I know you'll know this, but one of the things we have to do is figure out how to communicate about evaluation to others. So this slide explains outcome evaluation. The arrow misses the target. Oh, by the way, I need to give credit to um, Stephanie Evergreen. She did a makeover on my slides. You should have seen them before, and now they're beautiful, okay? <laughs> but these next four slides, I absolve her of any responsibility for. <laughs> she, she was really hesitant about it, but we didn't find a substitute, so I'm using these. Outcome evaluation. So in scenario A, there's an evaluation report. It comes out six months after the program is finished. It's very big, and the person who is in charge of the evaluation sees there are no results, and he's crying at his desk, okay? Scenario B, the arrow actually hits the target, and in this case, the high-risk youth is graduating from high school. That's what outcome evaluation is about. So one of the questions, and I do this with lots of audiences, these particular slides, one of the questions is, how do you sometimes get scenario A, or why do you get scenario A, and why do you get scenario B? And that leads us to a version, one of the reasons is a version of shoot, aim, ready, okay? People launch a program on a certain date, come heck or high water, whether they're ready or not. They haven't fully planned, and they didn't get outcomes. I also, if you remember way back, I also call this my Dick Cheney slide. Think about it for a moment. <laughs> Don't go hunting with Dick Cheney. Okay. Um, in this slide, there is more preparation. There's aim. They come close, but they don't quite hit the target. So bottom right is CQI, or continuous quality improvement. I got this pretty close. What do I need to do next time to get it even better and closer to my target? So here we have ready, aim, shoot, and hit the target. Okay. So in those four slides, I've kind of explained outcome evaluation, process evaluation, and continuous quality improvement. 
So one of the things, and, and in talking with Laura about, about my presentation, and again, I absolve her of all guilt as well. I'm totally accountable for what I've got here. Um, she said people might be interested in how I got into empowerment evaluation. Why, why am I doing this? And I got into it in a way, my trajectory, and certainly my, you know, I have a colleague that some of you know, David Fetterman, and we, we, we've partnered, but we've come at it from different directions. I got into it in the early 90s, looking at community coalitions, um, and in particular, community coalitions funded by the um, Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, and there were community coalitions for substance abuse prevention. And there's, there was a theory in a sense, okay? A theory is an explanation of a set of ideas. It's a hypothesis about a set of ideas. And the idea was if you could mobilize a community around a problem, whether it's homelessness or substance abuse or diabetes or AIDS or whatever, then you have a good chance of the community mobilization leading to a positive impact. And that idea back in the early 90s was um, not necessarily a new idea, but starting to become popular. It is now a very well-established idea and theory um, for in public health. So in it, there's a lead agency, and they try to get key community leaders together from different sectors of the community, business, religion, media, parents, health, groups, education, justice, grassroots groups, youth. And those folks will uh, do a needs assessment in their community. They'll consolidate the information in the needs assessment. They'll develop a comprehensive community plan. They'll implement that plan. And then hopefully at the end, they'll get these tremendous impacts, okay? There's a huge amount of optimism in community coalitions that if you can mobilize a community in this kind of way, you'll get this kind of outcome. You'll get a good outcome. Uh, my colleagues and I, particularly Bob Goodman in public health, we had four, we were local evaluators for four of these coalitions. Um, and that gave us a chance to be up close and personal with these coalitions. This is pretty complex, and what we did, so there were these three stages, formation of the coalition, implementation, and impact. Um, part of our job was to figure out, well, how do we map out this complicated thing? And what we did going um, horizontally is say, coalitions are complicated. There's an interperson intrapersonal level, interpersonal level, organizational level, community level, public policy level. You don't need to memorize the, the details on this. I just want to give you the big picture. And then down the first column were different measures that we used to try to map out what's going on in this coalition. Second phase is actual implementation of the plan. What actually happened? They, they spent all this time and energy coming up with a fancy, comprehensive community plan, announced it to the media, and then we needed to take a look at what actually got implemented. And we used a couple of uh, approaches, including something called Prevention Plus 3 that I had been involved in. And as you can see these dots, we were covering, trying to cover a lot of stuff. And then in terms of impacts, was this really making a difference? Key leader surveys, community surveys, trend data, uh, level of institutionalization scale to see if anything was sticking. And it turned out that um, a couple of things were, were illuminating for me in terms of empowerment evaluation. One of the things was that in the first year, the federal government required quarterly reports that came from the coalition to the federal government funder. And in there, it was an evaluation section. And I had the belief at that time, in the early 90s, that um, people uh, and coalitions, and particularly staff, they really didn't want to know much about evaluation. They wanted you to just get out of their way because they had all the real work to do and you're just a formality. That had been my impression. Well, we would share drafts of the report with them and they read every single word and they would help us. Sometimes we would omit we hadn't known about things or they would give us a different interpretation and they would help us make the report more accurate. We were fine with that. We wanted the report to be accurate. 
We also found that these quarterly meetings were like taking stock, like stopping pin in a coalition like a lot of the real world is a very hectic world. And the idea of taking stock every three months and looking in the mirror and saying, how are we doing? Did we accomplish what we wanted to accomplish? Where did we run into barriers? And what do we need to do in the next three months? And we, as evaluators, wanted to be helpful. I actually lived in one of these communities. If there was going to be less substance abuse in my community, I was going to welcome it. If this coalition could be more successful, that would be great. And actually, the federal government, and this was pretty um, advanced in their thinking at that time, wanted local evaluations to be helpful to, to coalitions. That may not sound shocking, but, but, but in those days, the idea that evaluation could be low, helpful on the ground and not just be a reporting mechanism, that was, that was pretty um, important from, from the funder. Um, so what, we be, what I began to realize, and I know this is not rocket science, was the importance of integrating planning, implementation, and evaluation. And in fact, I believe that you can't do good work unless you're evaluating what you do. And doing it pretty much in real time, and not waiting six months or a year to hear about how your results are doing, but that it's a real time kind of thing. All right, so coalitions are everywhere. I put on my glasses to read this. Um, but many efforts have failed. <clears throat> we like to bring together people from radically different fields and wait for the friction to produce heat, light, and magic. Sometimes it takes a while. So our idea was that maybe the knowledge and tools of evaluation could be helpful to practitioners in helping them do their work and more likely achieve outcomes. So this is a version of the definition of empowerment evaluation that uh, we've collaborate, collaborated on. David Fetterman and several other, others of us have put this forward. It's an evaluation approach that aims to increase the probability of program success. That's a really important part of this. Aims to increase the probability of program success. We would love these different programs, homelessness programs, AIDS prevention programs, high school graduation rate improvement programs. We would love for them to be successful. Uh, and this is done by providing program stakeholders, the people involved in these programs, with knowledge and tools from evaluation to help them plan more systematically, to implement with quality, to learn to self-evaluate, and to put that into a continuous quality improvement process. And that evaluation should be mainstreamed. It shouldn't be seen as an add-on. It shouldn't be seen as a burden. As I said before, I don't think you can do good work unless you evaluate. In empowerment evaluation, and this is in a empowerment evaluation book that came out in 2005 that David Fetterman and I co-edited, we have 10 principles that kind of set the stage. I won't go into this in any detail, but I want to give you a flavor. We value improvement, meeting people where they're at and helping them move higher. We value social justice. There's an uh, important emphasis on working with underserved populations, although we think that empowerment evaluation can work uh, everywhere with many popula all populations. We value inclusion of the key stakeholders, but not only their names on a list, but democratic participation. You have a handout that has some of the key ingredients on, on this. We value capacity building. We want people to build their own capacity to plan more systematically, implement, et cetera. I, I don't remember if these are on there, but some of the things I'm talking about are on there. We value organizational learning. There are many, many organizations that take a cover your butt approach to looking at data. We don't want to hear about it, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, et cetera. That is not a way to improve. We care about outcomes. We value organizational learning. The community or the organization owns and is accountable for the program, and therefore they are really in charge. We value community knowledge and expertise, the knowledge of the patient or consumer, the knowledge of the staff. They are experts 
in a lot of ways. We also, in number nine, value evidence-based strategies. It's important not to reinvent the wheel if there's a good enough wheel out there for you. And last but not least, we value accountability. We care that money and energy is used in a strategic way that leads to outcomes. So part of this leads to how do you do this? And one of the things we've gotten into is trying to take the mystery out of accountability and helping people actually uh, achieve results, looking at it proactively. What can we do? But accountability scares people even more than the word evaluation. And here's an example. You may remember this quote, hold me accountable for the debacle. I'm responsible. Do you have any idea who said that? Could be many people I know. Does this ring a bell? The rollout of the dot gov? Okay, who's to blame for this terrible mess? Retrospectively, it's not that hard to blame people. What we're interested in when we do empowerment evaluation is, can we pro be proactive? Can we help people actually achieve results? We think accountability is a good thing. And this involves planning and evaluation. So there are, one of the things that I like to say is there it takes two things to achieve outcomes. One is a good quality plan, and the other is to implement that plan with quality. And that leads us to something called GTO or getting to outcomes. And I'm gonna describe what's involved in a good quality plan. The first thing is you need to know about the needs and resources. What do you really need to do? And what are the potential resources to meet it? Given those needs and resources, what's your goal and what are your objectives? And now we come to, all right, we've set these goals and objectives. How are we gonna get there? What are we gonna do to achieve that? And that leads us, leads us to the evidence base, best practices, promising practices, if there aren't best practices. But this is where the evidence-based interventions come in into play. They help inform what we might do to meet our goals and objectives. But there are lots of times, there are lots of evidence-based approaches. So for example, I work in teen pregnancy prevention. There are over 31 evidence-based interventions on the federal list. We have to figure out which one will fit for our particular community or at the particular kids we're working with. Um, we also sometimes need to make adaptations. This is where we put adaptations in uh, our approach. Uh, but they need to be quality adaptations. And we need to have the capacity to actually do that best practice. Sometimes these best practices are developed with multiple millions of dollars, and then we expect some small organization in a rural area. Okay, thank you. Uh, some small, small organization in a rural area to implement that with fidelity in the same exact way that those folks at Harvard did it. That can sometimes be a problem. Number six is your plan. Who does what, when, where, and how. Those first six steps are also a strategic plan. So that gets us to the elements of a good quality plan. Now it's time to implement with quality and process evaluation comes in there. Number eight is outcome evaluation. This is show and tell time. What happened after we did all this work between three, four, five, six, and seven? Did we actually achieve the outcomes in number two? Number nine is continuous quality improvement. Maybe we achieved some of the outcomes, but not all of them. What do we do next time? Let's not, if we repeat the same thing again, we're likely to get the same result. What do we do to, to, do, to improve <clears throat> and continue in GTO? What we do is we review the answers to all the previous steps. And number 10 is sustainability. If this thing worked, how will we keep it going? So we take these, in terms of accountability and taking the mystery out of accountability, we take those same 10 things and we ask these accountability questions, okay? What were your needs and resources? And then there's literatures in how you answer these questions. We did not invent any of these 10 uh, steps in GTO, but we've put them together in one comprehensive approach and tried to make them pretty user-friendly. 
Um, the next accountability question is, where did these goals, you know, what, what are your goals, where did they come from? Well, they should be based on what you had in your um, uh, needs and resource assessment in step one. Questions three, four, and five relate to why are you doing what you're going to do to achieve those goals? Are you using something that there's evidence for? Does it fit with the population you're working with? Do you actually have the capacity to do it well? Number six is your plan. Do you have a plan for who's going to do what, when, where, and how? Number seven is your implementation. You had this great plan on paper. Did you really implement it with quality? Number eight is your outcome evaluation. All right, what did you get? Number nine is continuous quality improvement. How will you keep on going? How will you improve it over time? And number 10 is, if this worked, and many funders, almost every funder I know, keeps asking about sustainability, if this thing works, how will you keep it going? So here's where I have, because I uh, changed some of my beginning, I'm gonna skim this. And I am gonna be in a session tomorrow morning on getting to outcomes, so that's my safety valve. I'm gonna do uh, something that takes a little more time, just skim it. Step seven is implementation, implementing with quality. One of the things we've done is we've looked at the implementation science literature, we synthesized 25 implementation science frameworks and developed one implementation framework called the quality implementation framework. All of this is on the last page of the handout, so don't worry about the details. This is what the quality implementation framework looks like. It's in a very nice article that can put anybody to sleep. It would certainly put a practitioner to sleep. We've turned it into a tool called the Quality Implementation Tool. And the Quality Implementation Tool has different components that implementation science says lead to quality implementation, okay? So this is a theory that can be applied to what actually happened. It's my hypothesis that when you get variation, for example, in a multi-site intervention, you rarely get everybody doing the same thing and getting the same outcome. Some of the implementation clues might be helpful in that. All right, so I want to get now to this big picture. The <clears throat> going down are the 10 steps of getting to outcomes. And then horizontally, we have different levels, different system levels. So for example, we may have a problem with diabetes that let's say CDC is interested in. It's a big problem nationwide. And you know what? Different states have different levels of problem with diabetes. Some states are doing terrible, like my state. Some states are doing a bit better. But even within the state, there's a lot of variation. Different counties are doing differently. Within the county, um, there are different communities. There are rural areas, there are suburban areas, there are inner city areas. It can be different there. Then it comes down to the hospital level or agency level and the catchment area for a hospital. And what's that hospital gonna be doing about diabetes? And now they need to be more con concerned not only with the people who enter their doors, but nonprofit hospitals need to be concerned with the catchment area around them. And then what happens when we get down to the patient and provider level? And at the individual level, at the patient level, you can have a provider work with an individual patient with diabetes. A woman with diabetes who's 40 is very different than a man who's 80. And a different treatment plan with their different needs and resources is, is called for. And so you can work going down the columns, you're being accountable but we also need to be thoughtful about the horizontal accountability, how these different systems can work together or should work together, and how interdependent we are. We can say whatever we like at the national level about diabetes, but unless it gets down to the extreme right-hand side with the individual patients, it's rarely gonna make a difference in the health indicators. You can change these columns around. This is one that involves schools. We did an evaluation of integrating technology in the schools. Um, and <clears throat> this is something that's pretty big nationwide, giving kids iPads and all that. But actually getting teachers to teach differently and kids to learn differently, you have to go down all the way to the extreme right-hand side. So in terms of theory and, and science, step three, 
evidence-based practice horizontally, that's where the evidence-based interventions are. But if you're a parent with a child with special needs, you're looking at the column. What does my kid need in terms of health? What does my kid need in terms of um, education? What does my kid need in terms of these kinds of services? Holistically speaking is where the practice world often is, and they're thinking or should be thinking about the columns. Controversy. There is some controversy, as some people can attest, and there are lots of writings about that, and uh, some really terrific controversy has helped us try to progress in our work. Um, one of the big controversies has been our empowerment evaluators biased, because as I said before, we care about results. We would love this program to get outcomes. The way we address that particular criticism is our bottom line is the same as the bottom line in a traditional evaluation. Are more kids graduating from high school? Are there fewer people homeless? Our bottom line is the same. What we're doing is offering a potential means that would help improve. Um, there is a panel coming up at AEA in, in November in Chicago um, that will discuss uh, some of the controversies, the new book that's come out on empowerment evaluation. I presented these slides to um, my class, program evaluation class last week. One person said, hey, there's not much diversity in this panel. <laughs> and someone else said, yeah, some of them are bald. Some of them have gray hair. But in, in reality, um, Patton and Scriven have been um, uh, have done critiques of empowerment evaluation over the years and are well known for that and we wanted to um, move that forward. Marv Alkin is a more neutral person. Stuart Donaldson, who I don't know if he's here yet, who will be here at this conference, is the president of AEA, wrote a terrific forward. And um, we welcome everybody to uh, discuss and con controverse about empowerment evaluation and Mary is going to do a great job with that. So I just want to, in my last minute, remind you of what I've tried to say here. Okay? These, if you're having flashbacks, everybody else is too. <laughs> All right, so very quickly, <clears throat> this was the title that I landed on. These are the main points that I tried to make. Talked about the checklist study not working so well when it went to scale. That if you are head of a program or head of a boys and girls club, head of an agency, you're concerned with all of these things, but primarily the science is concerned with one of them. Talked about demystifying evaluation and accountability. Talked about coalition work, which was my entree, the reason I got into empowerment evaluation talked about what empowerment evaluation is, talked about demystifying accountability, the 10 steps of getting to outcomes, one of the steps, implementation science and practice. I'll talk more about that tomorrow. This very important slide for me, going horizontally, is a very important way of thinking about the interactive accountability going in the columns is a way of really thinking through what it means to be accountable. Controversy. Next steps. What are some things you can do? Um, you can attend the panel I do tomorrow. You can attend the panel at, at AEA. There are plenty of writings about um, empowerment evaluation. There's a copy of the new empowerment evaluation book out at the desk. There are free, copy, free copies, how-to manuals of getting to outcomes that are available on the RAND website, and there's m m information about that in your um, handout. And that table that I showed with the columns and the horizontal levels, it's a way of analyzing kind of what might have happened in something you're involved in. You might want to try filling that out and thinking that through. You can change those columns to be more meaningful to you. So that's it. This is, this is what it was about. Evidence-based interventions are necessary but not sufficient for outcomes. Empowerment evaluation and roles for evaluators in an evidence-based intervention world. Thank you.